Hello and welcome to Murder Analyzed. Thanks for joining us today. Before I start on this case today, I just want to shout out to all the new subscribers that we've got. Amazing, thank you for that. Um, keep it coming, it's great. Um, also, as well, because as you all know, I'm very new to this YouTubing um, stuff, but the, um, the viewers from um, and the comments we're getting from around the world, and I think yesterday, we had lots of new views from, I think it was um, Saudi Arabia, the Netherlands, um, I'll have to look, Denmark, Kenya and Sweden. So hello to all you, as well as all the people in the other countries that's been watching. I'm amazed by it, but I love it, so um, keep it up. So today's case, it's a case that someone um, did comment on and to tell me about this case because I don't know if you know in other videos I've talked about where we lived in Australia and my children were, were brought up in Australia and it's an amazing country and this case I remembered this case and it wasn't until I got that comment that I thought oh my god yes I do remember this case but I remember the case because it was determination I think of the family to find this child's body and to bring the perpetrator to justice. So this case is a um, Morecambe case and it's the Sunshine Coast, it's from Queensland Sunshine Coast in Australia and I think it happened in 2003. It took um, I think seven years, seven or eight years to, to find his body and a little bit longer I think as well then to um, get this perpetrator um, <laughs> caught for this and he, he was a serious um, offender. Um, so this case, I suppose, um, you know, is about, again, a child uh, murder. The man we're talking about is a sexual offender of children who was um, prosecuted for this case and is now in prison for this case. And it is a case about murder. And it is a case about where a body, luckily, was found. And so this family could put this child to rest. So I think before we start on the case, let's talk about this Sunshine Coast um, Queensland is an amazing state to live in. I've lived in it, so I know. I lived in Mudrabar, which was uh, on the Gold Coast. But I think I, I used to holiday actually on the Sunshine Coast in Noosa. And I know a lot of you, especially my friends in Australia, remember our days when we would go to Noosa. But I think I need to give you a bit of background on this area because in these areas when you live on the coast any coast whether it's anywhere in the world there's a more relaxed feel you feel safe you're not in a major city you're not in you know you haven't constantly got your worry of your children on your mind and especially in australia and especially at this time in 2003 you know we didn't hear about paedophiles so much they were around and we had the odd cases but now we are seeing lots more of it. But on the Sunshine Coast, it is this relaxed lifestyle. You know, you used to let your kids go out and um, catch the bus. It's normal, it's normal in Australia. Kids get the bus to school and at the bus stops. So this case is um, the Daniel Morecambe case. Now Daniel was 13 when he was abducted and he was abducted in 2003, 7th of December, 2003. So he's a couple of weeks away from his 14th birthday and a few weeks away from Christmas. And the reason that Daniel left his home that day was to go and get Christmas presents for his parents, who were great parents. Daniel was also a twin, he had a twin brother, and he also had an older brother as well. That day, he did ask his twin, do you want to come, you know, and we'll go to the local, shop, local shopping mall and get mum and dad some presents. But he, he didn't want to go, so he said, no, I'm going to stay home. I'm chilling out. Daniel's mum and dad were out at the time. So we are talking about nearly a 14-year-old boy that literally had to walk down the road. And the bus stop that he used to go to was not an authorised bus stop. The buses used to stop there but it wasn't an authorised bus stop. So, but usually, you know, it would. And I think it, this case just shows you how quick it is, 
for someone to abduct a child. Because Daniel was only seen three minutes before he disappeared at this bus stop. So it's quite a sad case this really, because there was a lot of um, circumstances leading up, you know, to this abduction and murder of Daniel. He'd left to go to the bus stop. The bus was late, he was standing there, it was late. It wasn't known until later that actually that bus had broke down about 700 me 750 metres away around the corner. Not that Daniel could see that. So he thought, I'll wait for the next bus. As he was waiting for the next bus to come along, a, a white four-wheel drive drove past him and quickly turned off into the street behind him. The man then got out of the car and walked to the bus stop and stood behind Daniel, leaning against a wall in quite a relaxed pose. So as people now were driving past, they could see now two people waiting for this bus. All of a sudden, this bus comes. The bus that had been brought in to um, you know, pick up people that the first bus that had broke down couldn't. But because this wasn't an authorised bus stop, the bus driver drove straight past. But Daniel didn't know that the bus driver had radioed through and said, I couldn't stop at that bus stop. But there was a shuttle bus literally minutes away coming to pick him up. In that time, for some reason, Daniel went away with this man. Probably this man said, I'll give you a lift to town. You've now got this young boy going off with a man to get a lift to the local shopping centre, which is only really down the road, but not in walking, but in driving. So Daniel, for some reason, for some unknown reason, and no one knows why he did. And as I say, in them days, you know, did we tell our children not to go in cars? Um, I think I probably did because I've I've always done the law and always done these sort of cases. But the normal person, this relaxed atmosphere that we live in, or we lived in in Australia at the time, and on the Sunshine Coast in this area, that you, this stuff didn't happen. You know, this is a a lovely community with lovely people, and it's. Um, I don't think Daniel knew the dangers, or if he did, he didn't realise it until it was too late because this man didn't drive him to the local shopping mall to buy presents for his mum and dad. This man continued to drive him about an half an hour away into a really wooded area, a farm. Now it's not like farms that we have in England. Some of these farms have got a lot of bush area, a lot of tree line area. And I think by the time that Daniel got there, you know, if you'd been in a car driving down this road, bushed area on either side of you, in the middle of nowhere, you would have realised at this time that something was going to go and miss here. So I think it's probably at that stage that Daniel knew um, something was really, really wrong and could do nothing about it. Plus, we don't know what this man was saying to him in this car, but you can only imagine. Um, about 4.30, 5, 4.30 time, Daniel's mother just had a really terrible feeling that something had happened. She had turned back, come back home. Um, his brothers were there and said Daniel had popped into the town to, to go and get some presents and he wasn't back yet. So about three and a half hours had gone by at this point. And his mother said she knew something at that point was really wrong because this was not normal uh, behavior from Daniel. Um, as the day went on, they went then to look where the bus stop was. They went to look all around. They went to the bus station and found out that the bus that he was meant to have got on was cancelled and that another bus driver and other people had seen Daniel waiting at a bus stop and then they found out that there was a man also waiting at the bus stop. They searched 
everywhere. You had locals searching at this point. They then went to the police station and told the police that Daniel was missing. And the police said at that point, well, you know, it's not been 24 hours. You know, he's probably just late home here, turn up. So the investigation was a little bit slow. And I think again, and because when you see what these police have done since then to, to try and find this body, they know that was a mistake. But I think when you look at the lifestyle there, the community there, they just thought he's gone to the shop, he's missed the bus, it's going to be a few hours late. No one really took it that seriously, apart from the mother and father and her family. They really, really knew. She said she knew then that something was really wrong. So as the days went on, there was um, a massive police search for this child. You had hundreds of people out. You had all the different services, and Australia has a lot of services because we are talking about a lot of bushland and stuff around in this area. Um, I think everywhere really in Australia you have to drive to. So, you know, it was a big area then to search. So they had the helicopters out, they had everything out looking for this child and there wasn't a sign of him apart from the last sightings of him at this bus stop. This investigation into the disappearance of Daniel I think was one of the biggest investigations, most extensive investigations that Queensland Police have ever really um, put into place in its whole time in Queensland history. And I think this comes from the strength of the mother and father. They never let this case go away from day one. They wanted their child back. They thought probably that he was dead, but they still wanted, dead or alive, they wanted this body back and they was gonna do everything they possibly could to get this body back. So the Australian government put up a $250,000, um, Australian dollar reward for um, any information um, and also 750000 uh, dollars, Australian dollars, was donated by um, private people. Um, that private award, that expired actually on uh, at midnight on the 31st of May 2009, so that reward was out there for a, a long time. Um, again, there was never much, you know, there was just no evidence, no matter what this police did, um, they couldn't find any evidence. So there was um, Seven News reported actually, um, there was, uh, and this is where this case, when it shows you where I tell you about what this community was like, to then realise the people that were living in this community. So you had a, a known paedophile called Douglas Jackway, um, and he was of interest to the police, um, and he'd been um, released, I think, from prison about a month before uh, Daniel's disappearance. Um, the, they, the police did come under a lot of criticism um, over Jackaway's release, and, and that, so that was another thing. So, you know, and I always say this, when they, they, we get these paedophiles and we get these sexual, sexual predators and they're in prison and then they go to a parole hearing and they're out. You know, and so when Daniel's um, disappearance took place just a month after um, Jackaway was released. There was a lot of issues going on in Australia about um, release dates and stuff. Um, I don't think it's changed so much now, to tell you the truth, as it was then because he actually didn't do it. But um, the Queensland government did come under a lot of pressure about releasing um, perpetrators like that onto our streets. And, you know, <laughs> If he had done it, I think it would have got worse, but he actually didn't do it. He wasn't the one that done this murder. So um, within this time of this investigation, the police did also make a clay um, figure um, that looked like Daniel and placed it in the same spot of where he had last been seen. Um, about 300 different um, people came forward then with um, different sightings and, and stuff of that day. So there was a little bit of... Um, that did help a little bit. But in 2009, um, Daniel's family requested an inquest into this, um, a coroner's inquest into this disappearance because there were a lot of people 
and coming forward and this is what they were interested in with saying that they knew who this killer was of Daniel and um, I, I think what happens when you're in a police investigation the police can't let everything out because if you uh, you you could be told that you've got you know 10 people could tell you that one person done this but you that is not reliable evidence you have to have evidence and so I think the police didn't want to release too much or tell the family too much because one it could have jeopardized the case anyway in the long run but two you don't want to give people false hope and so people yes there was a lot of paedophiles in this area there was but um you know and at this time they had probably questioned actually the perpetrator but to release that information out before you are sure you jeopardize allowing a perpetrator like this to go free so sometimes the family do find it difficult when police withhold evidence because they have to to complete their investigations and I think this is what was going on here the Queensland police actually did so much searching investigation into this disappearance of this young lad and rightly so rightly so but I don't think the family felt that they were being given the information and I think this was why they called for the inquiry to happen it was seen like it was going nowhere but it was really it was starting now to kick off and there was a lots lots more going on within this case that would bring this case to a conclusion so because of this investigation was you know building up speed now we're talking about 2009 um, that it really started to kick off and it wasn't until 2011 I think it was August uh, the 13th 2011 that um, Brett um, Cohen was um, or Cowan was um, charged and then um, with um, Morecambe's murder and I think he was charged with um, child stealing uh, depriving of liberty indecent treatment of a child under the age of 16 interfering with a corpse and other offences that having led under that had led this undercover detective um, to um, find um, Daniel's remains because I think what happened was was Brett Cowan was in prison at the time and an undercover officer was then placed in the prison cell with him and as I've said before these perpetrators like to brag about what they've done to fellow prisoners because sometimes prisons or most of the time prisons is like an education facility for some of these predators you know they go in medium low risk and can sometimes come out extremely high risk because of what they've learnt in prison because they love to talk about their crimes they just can't hold their self back they love it and I think this was how then this case broke so they knew they actually knew that he'd done it but this is where now it's took all this time to get the proof so as I said before it did they had interviewed him for this crime in 2006 so he was one of them early people that were um, suspects but again you can have many many suspects but it's proving it and so it took a very long time to prove this case and also in this time of course this body wasn't found until just after 2011 and I think the next day um, they found the body or the remains of Daniel um, on this thrown into a wooded area on this farm about half an hour away from where he lived and uh, just discarded but I think with this case it just shows you that this family really really thought they kept it in the um, press the press in Australia were great we had news channels putting this out everywhere no one forgot about this child no one there was rewards put out there was people still searching and I think this case yes it's come to a terrible conclusion you know but at least because I deal in a lot of cases where people don't get 
their children back in any form. And so I'm so pleased for this family that they did and they were able to bury Daniel and they now have somewhere to go and remember him by. And so I wish that family all the best. So on the 21st of August 2011, uh, the remains of Daniel were found in the Glasshouse Mountains um, on the Sunshine Coast. Um, there was uh, shoes found, um, there was a few bones found at first, but as the then investigation and as the forensic team then looked into um, this area, they then found underpants and a belt. Um, um, Daniel used to carry around this pocket watch um, and that was never found. So the perpetrator had taken that, robbed him as well as killed him and God knows what else he had done to him. But that was never found. By the end of this investigation, uh, 17 bones had been found, um, including rib, hip and leg bones and the vertebrae and they were all con um, confirmed by DNA. Um, from a toothbrush, I think, that um, was left in the home and his mother had kept it and they found the DNA from that toothbrush that matched uh, the DNA within the bones of Daniel. Daniel's funeral, I think, was held in, uh, on, the, on the 7th of December 2012. Uh, more than 2,000 people attended that funeral. And, um, you know, at least they got to bury him. So in February, on the 7th of February 2014, Cowan um, was ordered to stand trial. Um, he was charged with all the crimes uh, with murder. He was also charged with you know, dealing with a child of underage, um, improper dealing with a corpse. The trial was at the Supreme Court of Queensland. It began on the 10th of February 2014 um, under, uh, I think, Justice Rosalind Atkins, Atkinson. Um, and the prosecution closed this case on the 7th of March. There were 116 witnesses that gave evidence and over 200 exhibits were tendered into evidence. Again, as with all these um, perpetrators, Cowan um, pleaded not guilty and he also declined to give any evidence. So again, these police had to work to get him. This man wasn't ever going to admit anything at all. I think on the 13th of March 2014, uh, Cowan was um, found guilty of all charges. And on the 14th of March 2014, he was sentenced to life in prison with the possibility of, possibility of parole um, after 20 years. Now, Australia is not much different to our laws here in England. So again, you know, it's, you know, 20 years, this man could be out. You know, these predators don't change. There's no, re you know, reform for these predators. But this man still then tries to appeal this sentence, or well, tries to have it wiped, really. But I think we had a good judge here in um, judge, judge Atkinson, I really do, because she stated with this, I don't think um, that you should be released in 20 years time. And this then could affect what happens then at a parole, because they're going to take that into an account. Hopefully, they would take that into account. And this is what she knew. By saying that, she knew that this would be taken into account and he probably wouldn't get out after 20 years. I think he also got three and a half years on top of the 20 for moving the body or interfering with a corpse and also interfering with, um, with a child under the age of 16. Because don't forget now, we've had a lot of time gone past from where the abduction and murder happened to where the body was found. So it's difficult now, well impossible now, to find out how this child died and what happened to him before he died. It's impossible to know. And you have a perpetrator here, a predator here, that will not even give evidence 
at all. He will not talk about this. Well, not to the police and the courts anyway. But he will talk to other prisoners in the prison and tell them all about what he did. So Cowan, he um, did, as I said, appeal his sentence um, in the Queensland Court of Appeal under Justice Margaret uh, Mac McMurdo, uh speaking. Um, they wanted to have really this case overturned because of the evidence, the evidence of the undercover police officer that got in prison, that got this information. They said that it was inadmissible in evidence. They try everything, you know, they try everything. On, the, on I think in May, the 21st of May 2015, um, his appeal was dismissed, thankfully, um, or he would have been out if that evidence hadn't have held up, that would have been out. So undercover work is really important, but it's also sometimes open to a lot of controversy when it comes into court, it's got to be done really, really well. And um, I think in this case, they did it really, really, really well And the undercover police officer that went in and got this information from this man, did a great job, enough of a great job that it withheld even an appeal case. So good on, good on you for doing that and good on the Queensland police as well for sticking to their guns and getting this man off the streets. Um, the former uh, Queensland Attorney General though, um, he did appeal to have um, Cowan's um, sentence, uh, minimum sentence increased, but that failed. I mean, listen, we're lucky, you know, in this court system as we live in it today, that this man got 20 years plus three and a half for other stuff. We're also lucky now that this judge has also said, I don't think you should be out in 20 years, so they're probably going to hold him a little bit longer if they can. Um, so, you know, we don't want to, no one wants to over push the legal system, or else in the end you, you could lose. So the other reason I wanted to do this case, because in the time and, or around the time that these parents did everything they could to find their son, there was this foundation set up and it was called the, um, Daniel Walken Foundation and so it was put together really to help with resources and everything they needed to really you know um, find this child but once this child then had been found they then still use this foundation to help others it's about educating um, you know children about personal safety so they've they've still kept this foundation going and it's about giving awareness to children about what could happen, you know, you know, just because we live or we, are, you know, you live in this community that seems on the outset to have this perfect paradise, and it is a paradise, you know, the, these areas, you, you know, you wake up in the morning and it's amazing to wake up into the morning and, and walk outside and see this beautiful country, Australia is a beautiful country, but as with any other country, it's what un it's what's under the surface, and I think this foundation it's about educa ed educating children in, you know, and it's a terrible thing when you have to say to a child, you know, life isn't perfect, the world isn't perfect, people are not perfect. But I think this foundation is so important because if it saves one child's life, it's worth everything. So you can find information about the um, Daniel Walken Foundation and you can contribute straight to them. Um, if you'd like to, and this is throughout Australia. Good on this family, Australian word, so good on you, um, for doing what you're doing and continue to do what you're doing to support children and to support awareness to people all around the world, really. So this is an important message from this case, is that children should be aware, no matter how good your life is, no matter how much you think your community is safe, it's really not. So this has been the Daniel Walkham case, uh, Queensland, Australia, Sunshine Coast. And um, it's not the outcome I think that everyone wanted, but at least though, it's an outcome <clears throat> that I think the family can now live with. They've continued to make sure that this case stayed in the public eye. They've continued or have continued to make sure that their child had justice and they've actually been able to lay their child to rest. So thank you for watching. I hope you found this case interesting. You know what to do. 
thumbs up if you've liked this case you know hit this thumbs up button um subscribe to lacy and thank you for your subscriptions but you can subscribe by hitting the logo button you can subscribe all the way through these videos and at any point to our channel and welcome to everyone across the world and today with this case especially hello to everyone in australia who's watching i appreciate it thank you very much so you can follow us on instagram and on facebook so until the next time thanks for watching bye bye